I never thought that singing would be a career or something I would do for a living. Never. Oops, there goes my shirt up over my head. Oh my. Please you the man, cause you put it on me. And every morning I roll over, feel you touching on me. Growing up in Rochester, I'm the youngest of five, so I was a baby. I got away with a lot of stuff, but I, you know, grew up in the church. My parents were both in gospel quartet groups. It's a place where it was a foundation for me as far as musically and as um, everything else in my life. I remember discovering my voice when I was a little girl. I remember choir. We had the mini choir, we had the junior choir, we had the adult choir. So I was in a mini choir and I used to sing soprano. So, and I was a shy little girl and the director for the junior choir, she was like, oh my God, you're so little with that big voice. Not that it was huge, but I could, I stay on note, you know, I was little. So I became the youngest, me and another girl in the junior choir. So that's when I knew, oh, I could sing. And then when I heard Aretha Franklin, I started pulling out the brush in my bedroom and going in my closet. I had this little closet where I used to write down lyrics and things like that. That's when I knew I wanted to be a singer, I wanted to be a star, but I never um, knew how it was gonna happen or anything like that. But I discovered as a, at a young age. Becoming a mother so young, being in the church, um, I got sat down, you know, if anything. If I was in the choir, I couldn't sing in the choir no more. And I was ashamed because back then, um, that was something you don't do. You don't talk about sex, you don't do anything, you just don't wear makeup, you just wear skirts and you just sing for the Lord and that's your life, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, I, I know I disappointed my mom and my dad, but uh, I don't regret it, you know, because I have a beautiful young lady now. And, um, but it was hard at first because back then you didn't do that. You know, a lot of the girls that did it was called fast. Even though I wasn't fast, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's what it was back then. I met Devante in 1993. Jodeci had their last record, I think the show, The After Party, you know, that record. They recorded the rest of it in Rochester, New York. So in coming to Rochester, Devante brought the basement crew, which consisted of Missy and sister, Tim and Magoo, Genuine Player, and he had another group, Sugar. A guy, Billy from Rochester, New York, told me that they were looking for some girl, you know, to audition. I don't want to be no, in no group, you know what I mean? Even though I was in a gospel group, a girl group, I didn't want to do that. So he said, just go and just, you know, see what happens. And I went down to Dejalon Studios, and behind this wall, I could see people peeping and listening, right? And I saw Missy and I saw a couple other people and uh, that's how I met Missy. She came out, she was like, oh my God, I love your voice. So we became really close after that and I met Tim. That's how we met. We all were at the studio and I got the part. Being in Sugar, it was a whole different thing. Like these young ladies, uh, I was a much older, you know what I mean? I was growing into being a woman. So being there um, taught me a lot. They taught me a lot about being sexy too. Like. I was sheltered a lot, so I didn't, and sexy, I don't mean sexual. I mean just, you know, wearing cute little stuff instead of sweats, because I'm a, I'm a sweat and jeans and t-shirt girl all day. So um, they taught me that. Dejalon Studios, I don't know if it's still up right now in Rochester, we were in there 24 hours a day. Um, and when we weren't there, Devante rented out uh, apartment complex of like four or five um, apartments, and we all had our separate apartments. And then if we weren't there riding at home, we were at the studio. So it was a, a boot camp, like what they're trying to show on TV. We, we went through the artist development like that and it was hardcore. Um, and if you weren't performing or um, writing or doing creative stuff, then you got to go, like you don't belong here. He wanted to really recreate Motown. Uh, I remember we used to have uh, meetings on Wednesdays in the kitchen of the studio and he would bring his dog Skills. You remember that episode of Martin when Martin came with the dog and he was doing Nino Brown? That's how it was for real for us. That's how harsh it was. He was really 
serious about the music, you know what I mean? But he also just wanted to make sure we were in check and all of that stuff, so. The number one thing for us was we couldn't listen to anything on the radio. We couldn't watch anybody on TV artist-wise because he wanted us to sit and be comfortable in our origin originality. So that's what I learned. He was a genius. He is a genius. And I just learned just to be myself and um, don't compromise who, who I am. And he was hard on us, very, very hard. We have some stories, very hard, but I appreciate it now. Missy and I were close and have been even from the beginning. I think because we had a lot in common as far as growing up in church and just being creative. And um, Missy wanted me to be in sister. We had a little tiff with my group and her group because they was trying to get me to be in sister and Devante wasn't having it. We have so many stories, it's so hilarious now that I think about it. But we've been friends and um, close sisters for a long time, from the beginning. Tim had his own room downstairs in the basement and he would be in there forever. Tim never came up for air unless he was asked, so he was always in his craft. We were more goofy. Uh, we were always drinking Thunderbird, and you know, we had the party vibe. That's how we created. I remember the first record me and uh, Missy and I did, we were at a party. Someone had a birthday party at the studio, and we were in there, and Missy was like, come on, let's do a song in the middle of the party. We went to Studio A, which we could really still see people partying, and we recorded um, Sugar and Spice, the record that I think they let Aaliyah hear, and that's how they started working with Aaliyah. I'm sweeter than a chocolate 2000, we lived in LA. He took us to LA to finish the album for the 13th time. The truth started coming out. Susie and I both were mothers and we were tired of doing the same thing over and over again because he kept getting deals and then not delivering the product and then we would lose the product and then we had to go back and do it again and again. Everybody had left from Missy and Tim and Genuine and Playa so we were the last group left of the original Basement crew. We had other artists but we were the last ones left and we didn't feel like nothing was going to become of it so we decided to disband. I was devastated. My dad had this blue Lincoln Continental that was really on its way out. So I used to take that and ride right out here on the beach and go to the water and think about what am I gonna do? Cause I had a daughter, I had, I had no job, I had no money, I had nothing. So I'm thinking I'm about to um, go and buy the water, maybe jump in the water, but I'm so scared of water, I can't even swim. One day out of the blue, Missy called me and was like, I need you to out in LA. I'm like, what? She was like, yeah. I was like, whatever. All right, girl, I'll talk to you later. At that time, I was contemplating doing something to myself, you know? And she came at the time, I always call her my guardian angel because she came at the time when I was ready to go out. I didn't want to be here anymore. You know, being a mother, you want to be able to support and take care of your child, and I couldn't do it. And it hurt my heart, you know? So. She's like, okay, you better have your bags packed. But the next day she had a limo at the house. And I was on my way to LA to do her background vocals for Missy So Addictive. But she came at the right time. Always though. I love everything about you. Take away, yeah. You go to platinum chains. Your love to me is platinum day. Love you. Creating with Missy is always fun. So I had an absolute ball. Like we used to have this one room in the studio called the Fun Room. And we just went up there and just had fun and then we'd go down and record. So it's always fun. It's never like, um, it's very organic. And um, I didn't know at the time, you know, I was still coming off of, you know, not knowing what I was doing with my life. But being there, I kind of got a sense of, okay, this is it. I, maybe I am going to be uh, a part of this whole music thing. Because I was down. I didn't want to do anything. Um, but when Missy called and I went out there, it was another, like, another lease or another chance, you know, to do this thing that I love. I just want to be the perfect match. You don't even have to ask. Don't, don't have to ask. I just want to be the perfect match. Becomes so. In the midst of doing the backgrounds for Missy So Addictive, I was in the fun room by myself with a guitar. 
and I was playing motel. And she, again, was sneaking and listening like she did when I auditioned. And she came and said, what you doing? I put the guitar down, because I didn't want nobody to really know at the time. Um, she's like, play that. You was just playing the guitar. I was like, yeah. She's like, play the song. So then I played uh, Motel. Then I played, I think, um, Get Away, Move On. It was like a couple. She's like, oh, no, nah, all right. You ready? I was like, what you mean? She's like, all right, I'm going to take you to New York. You got to meet Sylvia Rome. Sylvia, I love her so much. I just walked in the office, in her huge office at Electra at the time, and I started playing. I don't think I got through the whole song before she was like, oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and that was that. And Sylvia always had my back from then on. Whatever I wanted to do, she supported me. Whatever song I wanted to release, she supported me. So it was an amazing relationship. I miss her. I would still be signed to her right now if I could. Same time, out there in L.A. with the Missy So Addictive, we were riding in the car, going to the studio, and she put in a CD that Tim gave her of tracks. And the Oops track came on, and I started singing a song that I wrote to another track back at my, you know, apartment. And she was like, what is that? I was like, it's just something I think it goes to that. And she was like, sing it again. I was like, tell you what I did. Started singing it. She was like, oh, no, nah, we, we recording that tonight. So same day we recorded it, and she did it, and that was that. You got the mastermind behind the crazy hot cut. Oops, oh, my the house. My girl tweet. You know what I'm saying? Her album's in stores right now. Southern Hummingbird. Tell you what I did last night. I came home, say, around a quarter to three. Still Oops is about self-love. Um, I remember watching Oprah. And it was a doctor on there that said everybody in life should get naked and look at themselves in the mirror and love everything they see about themselves, not wanting to change a thing. So I said, all right, that's cute. Kept that in the back of my head. So it's not about nothing sexual? No, you it's sure? about I'm positive. What's, what, what's, the regular, what's, the, what's, the, what's the regular about? What's the regular about? It's about self-love and appreciation. You know, I was real insecure with myself for a while. And then I know the tricks because Devante told us and taught us that sex sells. So I'm like, OK, it may can sound like I'm talking about that, but it's a clever way to say love yourself. And if people think it's about that, whatever, take whatever interpretation you want. That just means you listened. <laughs> there goes my skirt dropping to my feet. Oh my, oh my. I was nervous, but uh, not nervous like that. I was just like, oh my God, I did an album. Yeah, I finally completed something. Because mind you, uh, Sugar, we never, we completed, but we never was done, like this is really about to come out. So for me, that was my Grammy. I had completed it. Um, I just got off tour with Mary J. Blige, and um, there was talk of going on tour with Nelly, but I don't know, being that I have to do the single and the new album, so we're trying to work that out right now. Opening up for Mary J. Blige was a huge moment for me. I had just came out as an artist, a new artist, um, opening up for a huge artist like Mary J. Blige. Ciao, yeah. <laughs> Call me. Oh my God. Uh, people really don't understand how that was like the least, that was the last song I did because I needed another up tempo. And Missy and I were talking, and she was like, Yeah, we need just another one just to add. And she sent over call me with the first verse and she was like finish the record and that's how call me came about it really wasn't my idea that's all missy i just finished the record <laughs> baby mama though i like to call me real late at night when my man is sleeping take a red eye i think i have an art against it because it was the second single and i didn't want that song to be the second single i wanted smoking cigarettes and nobody listened to me because we had called me at a Verizon commercial. So why not get three records? We can have that one out and another one. We prepped um, smoking cigarettes, went to Canada, shot a video, Little X did it. We had Boogie Tonight in the beginning and then smoking cigarettes. Perfect. We had the Truth commercial people, we had the Truth ad in it and all of that. It was a huge thing. We're going to shoot the video within the, within the next two weeks and the song is about um, I was in, how I was in a relationship and we broke up and the only way I could cope with the breakup was to pick up a cigarette and smoke.
they passed on it. Oops for me was wonderful, but it wasn't what the rest of the record was. The, record, the rest of the record was uh, beautiful and call, not call me, but smoking cigarettes always will. It was very soulful. And I wanted to get on that before the world just thought I was this hip hop chick, you know what I mean? And that's what it frustrated me about the whole situation. I never wanted to be a lead singer. I never wanted that. I always love the harmonies and I love the blends and things like that. I always wanted to do that. So that's what my craft was. And I don't mind helping people out. Like, take the lead, y'all. After my first album, people don't know this, but I was still working, doing backgrounds for a lot of artists. Backgrounds can bring a whole song into a whole aroma. You know what I mean? It just does something to a song. I'm not like the best singer in the world, but people know me for my backgrounds. Like, they be like, oh, we heard them background, girl, we know that's you. You know what I mean? So it's something of a tweet thing. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm happy. Karen Clark, I wrote a song for her on her gospel album. Monica, So Gone, I wrote the hook for that and did that. I remember Missy had me on Madonna's American Girl, I think it is called, but I was on that and I was like, oh my God, I'm, okay, okay. <laughs> but that was amazing, it's, I, I mean, yeah. Whitney got the record that I wrote for her um, because Missy sent her some submissions, song submissions on a CD and one of my songs, that song got mistakenly put on there, which wasn't a mistake. Huh? And she loved it and called him like, I need that record. And being in the studio with her was amazing. One of the proudest moments of my career. And after that, we became very close friends. She used to be at my studio sessions all the time in Miami and we just, she was so cool. I think people got her so misunderstood. She was just down to earth and like your homegirl, your auntie, like she wasn't difficult or anything. She was a beautiful person and I would love her for life. <laughs> that was my dog. We were in Miami and I took her to a club, like a club, a hood club, not a club club, right? So we driving in the, in the car and we pulled up and my security got out and told the people at the front, we have Tweet and um, Whitney Houston in the car. They was like, whatever, you got Tweet and who? So she went up to the front. She was like, don't y'all know? She said more words than what I'm saying. We sitting in the car, we waiting, let us in the club. They cracked up, the whole line was like, oh my God, it's Whitney. Bobby was mad because I took her to the club, but it wasn't no hood club. It was just a club everybody went to at that time. Miami was hot back then and we had to go to the club. So we went to the club, we had a ball, and I remember that for the rest of my life. When it came down to recording my second album, my biggest concern was having creative control like I had on the first record. Missy, Electra, Sylvia didn't bother me, they let me do me. I wanted whatever we created to be on the album. But that didn't happen because in the midst of that, Electra merged into Atlantic. The reason why it took me so long, I was, you know, got caught in a merge between the two record companies. Right, right, right. So I had to sit back and stay in the studio and make sure this album is hot. They didn't know who I was, you know what I mean, like that. They wanted me to do more, you know, street urban stuff. So they took off half of my records and we had to do like five with uh, Missy and, um, soul diggers, um, and that's what I did. And once I compromised that, I said, okay, I'll do it, but okay. First single came out, turned the lights off, that was it. They didn't do anything, they didn't, we didn't promote the video or anything. Nothing happened. They sat me on the shelf and I asked to be released. And that was that. And I was done at that point. That was my, I'm not doing this no more, I can't. I disappeared, I shut everybody out. I was mad because we had a full album done, ready. And they made me compromise and they didn't do anything. Mind you, I had came from 93, 94, a group. We had did the same record over and over again, then this, you know, and then it's just like, come on, I don't got time for this. I got a daughter, I'm about to go home, <laughs> stay home, and that's what I did. Got into the church, got back you know, rede rededicated my life to God and started going to church. And it was a 10 year, ten year hiatus before I dropped anything else. It was easy to fall out of love 
with it because I felt like people were abusing it. I just was like, I can't do this no more. I would rather just sit and get my spirit right because at that time I was like, all right, I'm back to contemplating. I'm back to, because this was heavy for me, you know? And then I remember watching um, BET's gospel, uh, Tone was singing, Lord, make me over. Let me hear you say, Lord, make me over. Lord, make me over. Now, at that point, I was smoking three packs a day. I was drinking all day, Bombay, wine, in my own. I had isolated myself so much that I didn't even want people to see me. So I found this little apartment in Atlanta and was in there all day just smoking and drinking by myself. I hadn't even allowed my daughter to come over with me at the time because she was still down here. In the midst of my one of my drunken episodes, I watched Tone A say, sing that record, Lord, make me over. And I fell to my knees immediately and started crying. That was the rock bottom I needed though. That was what I needed at the time. I never called it depression. I just thought, I used to always say God hated me. I thought it was just another episode of, I used to call myself a lab rat for God. <laughs> and okay, is another thing going on. Then I would get mad and just shut down. You know, but I didn't know that that was depression. And even though it, it still creeps up sometimes, you know, because the industry is cruel. Especially now, if you don't have a million uh, Instagram followers, you know, you're a has-been or you're, you're old or you know, things like that. So it can take you back to that space. And I've been there. At the end of the a hiatus, I got a call from, I can't remember who it was, but Gerald Busby was interested. And I had a meeting with him. He was like, I don't want to own your, your music. You can have your masters. I just want to be the one to help you get your stuff out. It's like, are you serious? It's like, yes. And unfortunately, we did a whole record. Unfortunately, he passed away the week we were supposed to release the first single. And then here I go again. Oh no, not this again. I'm coming out of all of this. Yeah, lab rat, you know? <laughs> Here we go again. And I was so devastated at that because he honestly, that was the best deal, but it's not, it wasn't even about the deal, it was about him. It, it still chokes me up because I wish he was here to see that I, I did continue. You know, I did stick with it. Simply Tweet was after Love Tweet, which was on Gerald Busby's label. I was gonna be on the first season of R&B Divas. And we had to sing, and he heard me sing. He was like, oh my God, okay. Would you like to be on my label? And I'm like, okay, well, what about the show? He was like, yeah, we could do the show. And the, But it never, it ended up me being more concerned or more interested in doing the music than, than putting my life on television. They were one-offs. So uh, all the record deals were one-offs because I wasn't sure. So I just did, like, okay, we'll see what happens. Let me do the record. So I only signed because I really wasn't sure, but they were one-offs, so I didn't really, I was either gonna win or lose. Yeah. Your body smooth as sandpaper, the way you try to run your game. Charlene was, I think, one, that's my favorite record out of all of them. It's not Southern Hummingbird, it's Charlene. Charlene was a, ah, a, 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 a aha moment for me. Um, and in recording it, we was just in there just vibing. It was such a vibe. And I think everything f uh, fell into place. It was never a problem with anything. So, you know, all this time I became a woman really in that record. I'm like, oh my God, I feel so renewed and refreshed and things like that. And new love and new, like everything new was happening. And um, I, so I didn't care about the past. Even though it taught me lessons, it wasn't what that moment meant. Wait, 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 wait. I haven't played and did this song in a long time, so if I mess up, like they say in church. And this is how you really sing it, you people that's on YouTube. This is the real Southern Hummingbird. My relationship with my daughter is something, okay? Uh, we have this on and off relationship because she's still... She's still a little mad that I wasn't there, you know, so we're still working through stuff, but I feel like um, she's getting what uh, <laughs> she, 
is mad at me for, I'm now in her position to take care of her son. And now she's feeling, she's like, Ma, now I know what you're talking about. I'm so sorry. Uh-huh, girl, I told you. Mm-hmm. So we, um, we're working through a lot of stuff, and it's just a lot of healing that needs to happen, and we're working on that. I bet y'all remember this. Today's a day. Like they shouldn't know, Mom. They do know that. It, didn't, it, went, it went overseas. It went this new age R&B, it's nothing but sampled old R&B, okay? So there's no way it could be dead. I don't, I like some of it, but at some point, all of the music is starting to sound the same. So it's like a broken record. Like, I can't, I, my ears bleed. It's like somebody feeding you Burger King every day or McDonald's. Don't you get tired of eating McDonald's every day? Like, I want a variety. Back in the day, we had like a gumbo full of artists. Like, we had Prince, we had Michael Jackson, we had, it was different things. Everybody is just on this one track, mind. Everything sounds the same. Nobody's talking about anything. Everybody's gibberish, wearing tight, skinny jeans and makeup and all, I can't. Oh, I just completed the new record. I don't have a title for it yet, um, but it's done. Uh, produced by the same guys. Um, Tashana will be on it. Have a duet with uh, BJ the Chicago Kid, uh, Raphael Sadiq. I'm trying to get um, Bilal again. Like, I, really my dream collaboration album would be for him and I to do like a Tammy Terrell, Marvin Gaye type of uh, album. We talked about it years ago. We just got to move on it. Right now, I'm really dealing with being affected by the hurricane. Hurricane Michael hit, and my family, uh, from my mother, my father, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, we all were affected. So we're having to move, and uh, it's just, it was catastrophic. And the, the people have forgotten about it. I've seen a lot of people talk about pray for this and pray for this place, but never Panama City. Everything was down, the trees was down, you couldn't get through. It actually shed a, many tears because you can't really tell even now what street is what, you know what I mean, or anything like that. It's just heartbreaking. And uh, that's what I'm dealing with now. I haven't been able to be in my house in a month. It's almost two months now, a month and a half. And my mom had, dad had to relocate and my uncle's whole house, the whole roof is gone. He said he saw his actual roof and ceiling going up in the air and all of that. The back patio is demolished, nothing's there. So it doesn't, it looked like um, a war zone here and nobody's talking about it. 13 to 21 people lost their lives. Why isn't that news? That's news. <laughs> Why wouldn't that be news? People are hungry. Why isn't that news? People have nowhere to live. Why isn't that news? Why isn't that important? Just as important as anything else. FEMA has only um, approved 50 people out of 50,000. The whole city is, is demolished. I can't go home. I don't know when I'm gonna be able to go home. And for me, that hurts because we're such a tight-knit family. We have barbecues every weekend, you know, all of that. We play cards, we laugh, we do all of this. And that whole bond is broken now. I'm partnering with this church, bringing supplies in for people that didn't have the insurance companies or the money to fix up their houses. We're gonna fix up their houses and things like that. I'm bringing, you know, as much help as I can you know, to help people. I just want to go home. You know, I haven't slept in my bed. I just want to go home. And I'm also battling a little bit of um, uh, anxiety as far as coming back in the industry with this new record. I'm not afraid to put it out. I'm just, I'm just tired of not having the support. You know what I mean? I just want, because I don't have a management team, 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 a team, team. Um, uh, so that's what I'm dealing with now. When I was on that hiatus, I woke up praying and, and on my knees and I was reading the word all day like I was one of those militant Christians, you know? <laughs> but today, you know, I, I, I have a relationship with him. 
uh, it's not religious, it's spiritual. You know what I mean? I'm not um, the deep Christian. Um, I'm, I'm a woman of God and we have a relationship where I talk to him like I'm talking to you. You know, and I don't have to be on my knees to communicate. Um, and um, he's still working with me. I'm still a work in progress, you know, like everybody else. As long as I'm in that progress, a process of process, then I think uh, I'll be all right. Yeah. Just a little girl from Rochester trying to make it still. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs>